the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here, author of the Cannabis Business Book, and you're listening to the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, where I chat with and coach the highest performing entrepreneurs in the cannabis industry. Hi, Mike Z is, hi, Mike Z is, hi, Mike Z is, the Cannabis Business Coach. Hi, Mike Z here, and on today's episode of the Cannabis Business Coach Podcast, I'm joined by Marie Momarquet, who is the co-founder of MD Numbers, which includes a number of cannabis brands, so I'm excited to talk about the vertically integrated situation you've got working over there in California. Before we do that, if you don't mind, can you just introduce yourself to the folks who might be watching or listening? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Michael. Really appreciate it. Um, Marie Momarque, I am sitting in San Francisco right now. I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee, and moved out to California 11 years ago now to get involved in Stay Out of Trouble and Compliant Cannabis. So my brother and I have created um, MD Farms, which is a 50,000 square feet cultivation facility in Salinas, California, where we have processing, a nursery, um, basically a wholesale distribution facility. And then we have a delivery called Marie's Deliverables. And then we've started a number of other small um, distribution and consulting companies. Awesome. And tell me a little about how did, how or why did you get into the industry? When you're in a state that is not, you know, compliant and is currently criminalizing the industry and all sorts, I was growing up in Nashville, Tennessee, and I went to college and I just fell in love with cannabis and I was willing to go to jail for cannabis. I have gone to jail for cannabis, but I knew that there had to be a better way, you know, <laughs> if a much safer state or a safer existence to participate in um, compliant cannabis and be a professional uh, a drug dealer, as they say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I really wanted to to take what I was learning in in Nashville, which was kind of recreating everything that I was taught in Dare growing up, or you know, in my biology classes about how terrible um, all of these different you know drug experiences could be for you. And then when I started really getting into cannabis and smoking a lot of cannabis and hanging around people that smoked a lot of cannabis, it really opened up my eyes that. There's a lot of BS surrounding, you know, the stigmas, the laws, the science, the legalization. And I just really wanted to figure out how I could um, be free, you know, first and foremost, and do what I loved, which was be involved in cannabis and stay involved in cannabis in a legal way. Awesome. So you moved to California and got into the legal industry. So it, it and I know you're you're not too shy about sharing that you are a legacy operator and were involved in the industry in some capacity prior to getting into California cannabis and getting licensed and regulated and all that stuff. I'm not going to dive too deep into that because you know I don't I don't want to get anyone in trouble or open up any cans of worms and I don't know how statutes of limitations work. I'm not an attorney and I don't pretend to be one on the podcast, but I do want to ask you about the transition and what it takes to go from legacy or underground into the regulated industry and, and how that process went for you. I definitely think it's a great question. Over the course of, you know, California, we have initially been legal since you know 1996, right? And all that you had to have in 1996 was a seller's permit, and you could start essentially with um, the basic paperwork, incorporating your business through the state of California, and get all your collective agreement paperwork, and you're running under a, a co-op, essentially, so a nonprofit, and that was a way easier um, point to get started. So for me, I'm just very fortunate that. I had a little bit of foresight 10 years ago to run out here as fast as I could and get involved in that and try to like, I knew that there might have been a grandfather period or there might be something that I could go ahead and, you know, hitch my wagon to so I could get a head start. Um, it did happen and it didn't happen. So our farm, for instance, was grandfathered because we were always in good standing and we had paid our taxes on time 
consistently since the opening of our farm in 2016, 2017. Um, but for the delivery, for instance, and every other type of business, there was not really like a grandfather in transition, right? So if you, if we wouldn't have had that, that leg up, so to speak, we would have been spending 10 times the money, taking 10 times the time to try to build out these same businesses that we had already established. So it's, it's a little different, like for me coming from the ability to make that transition from Prop 215 into Prop 64. Like we're so blessed and fortunate to have had that time and literally just enough time to get enough pieces in place and a foundation built to evolve into the, the industry as it is right now. Um, it's really hard to get into the regulated industry coming from, you know, just somebody who has a book of business and is doing well, and they might be extremely profitable. You might have a ton of business. You might be doing all sorts of amazing things in distribution, but taking that same concept and putting it into legalization right now is very difficult, primarily because of the barriers to entry that there are. So you're going to have to really just understand if it's worth the time and the cost that it's going to take for you to transition into compliant cannabis. Let me just ask as a quick follow-up, where did you start off with that, with the first legal business? Was it that collective that you mentioned or, and, and then the farm came later or can you, can you walk me through kind of the evolution of that? For sure. We had our our delivery service first so that's really where even now i would say it's one of the easiest licenses for you to get your hands on distribution only or delivery only if they're not as um extensive permit processing for those versus retail or cultivation um but for us we started in delivery and that was in 2015 and we started in a pretty conservative city in Northern California that is in a dry county to this day. There's no, no storefronts um, in that county. And so we were able to take that business and really like learn quickly. We got a lot of business insights just from being involved in delivery. You touch so many pieces of the business. Um, and then we took that and we went to Los Angeles because we wanted to open up a Northern California and a Southern California hub. And when we went to Southern California, we realized that the market does not purchase weed in the same way. And they don't have the same uh, like preferences when it comes to strains or the different even like, you know, names that might come with them. If they're attached to like a certain terpene, they really like gassy terpenes. They really like very heavy flower um very indica driven flower where we i mean this was in 2015 so we were selling um very very exotic very triple a when cookies and all of those things were first coming out and you know, all the platinum girl scout cookies and all the crosses from those um and at the time when we went to la we realized that there wasn't the same appreciation for that um, and a lot of the storefronts down there and even delivery services down there had a $35 cap, meaning that they didn't sell any eights that were more than $35. So we came from $60, eights, $50, it's like very, very high quality. Um, and it was just a different, we had a different market. You know, we were selling to a lot of families that had a lot of disposable income in the Silicon Valley area. And then going down to LA and we were not having that same that same market as available to us. So at that moment, we realized that we needed to get involved with cultivation or we weren't going to have longevity from being able to go into all of the markets that we wanted to penetrate at some point and expand to. And of course, California being the biggest state for cannabis in most ways, uh, we definitely wanted to have a model that was successful in Northern California and Southern California. So that's what made us immediately come we went we came back up to northern california and found our farm in salinas and started growing wow amazing i love hearing about the differences between norcal and socal cannabis i've, I've lived in both places and 
it makes a lot of sense because I think they're culturally very different in a lot of ways, but it's always interesting for me to hear what kind of strains or, or cultivars or whatever do well in what region. And I think that's even true still today with East Coast versus West Coast. Oh, yeah. And and I'm sure other places have their own preferences, too. So, so you decided we need to we need to cultivate to be able to to sustain in this industry long term. And and then where did you go from there? Yeah. So there we packed up the shop in Southern California and came back to Northern California. And we had a few business associates that were cultivating in Salinas in and around Salinas area. And so we just started to get familiar with looking for real estate. We found some potential partners and not really partner, but a grower that we could partner with on this particular cultivation and had some faith that he would uh, see us through to success. He did not, but we had some faith at the time that he would and so eventually we pounded enough pavement and my brother testament to him he probably met with i don't know 20 30 different realtors to see almost every property that was available in salinas just to make sure that we were setting ourselves up for success as far as the real estate goes so we were able to find some good real estate in salinas and we have now right now we have 50,000 square feet but we were just able to secure another four acres so we're on the beginning of building out another facility kind of like the the one in my my background here awesome and that looks that looks nice i wish i could teleport into the facility no. <laughs> we've had our farm you know, over five years now and it took us four to five years to be cash flow positive like for a long time, it was just, we would call it the money pit. And so even when I when I talk to people that want to come into compliant cannabis, even if it's in retail or distro or all these things, right? It's, you definitely have to be willing to not get paid, not make money and to take, especially if you're doing this in a illicit market coming into a taxable market, you're going to have to take less profit. You know, it's just more about longevity, but for us, yeah, we, me and my brother, we probably should not still have this farm or been successful just based on the data and all the unfortunate things that were happening to us. But it was definitely a, a testament of just keeping your head down and figuring out a way to, to be successful. But yeah, like any business, you know, if it takes a small business three to five years to be profitable, then you look at 280E and the regulatory framework and the taxation that we have, Oh, you you might never make any money so you really have to love <laughs> what you're doing and and you know a lot of people just make it look good because they've they've found some investors and they've raised some money and they're throwing it around a little bit but you really have to understand like the difference between like prop 64 or the gray market as we call it now you know that's the, where the money is that's that's where the money was so coming into this market you really have to be willing to to not make as much money and be willing, you know, to go and raise money. Cause this is a, I, I kind of put it like back then we were making money. Now people are raising money. It's a totally different, you know, experience, but people, it, because of who was making money back then versus who's making it look good now, it's just a totally different uh, cultural shift of the experience that you see. Oh, wow. You're, you're getting us into into the good stuff now the triple a top shelf conversation i'm glad you took us here because i want to ask you about the money side of things a little bit going back to even the delivery service well i have so many questions now oh my so the delivery service and and more i'm talking about in today's world and today's regulatory regimes my understanding is that the margins on delivery services really not that good and it's a lot of a lot of overhead and you're not making a ton of money unless you're doing really crazy volume or you're selling your own products i'd love to hear a little about the economics behind it anything that you're willing to share and and also then going back to the cultivation taking a few years until your cash flow positive having to raise money and 
I, I just want to hear a little more about all of that and especially the raising money piece. And in particular, my, my question is around when you're talking to potential investors and the whole legacy operator thing comes up. I know that for some investors, that's deal breaker potentially right away because it makes them too afraid that there's the criminal element. And if this person is willing to to break the law or, or whatever, it's hard to trust them with hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And on the other hand, there's some investors who either come from that background or appreciate that, hey, to have experience in this industry, you really had to be a legacy operator. Otherwise, you know, maybe you've just been doing it for a couple of years and then are arguably even more risky to, to put my money in the hands of of someone who's just been doing this for a year or two or a couple of years. I know that that's a whole bunch of different questions I, I threw at you, but I'd love to hear anything that you're able to, to share on any of that. Yeah, I took a little bit of notes so I can follow. Um, as far as economics, right? I think that's a beautiful place because that's where everybody, you know, why are we in business to make money, right? Um, the state of California took in $831 million from cannabis businesses while cannabis businesses have no federal tax write-off. So to your point of delivery, um, I took Oaksterdam University in one of their one of their classes, they analyzed 280E and they analyze, you know, the average retail that's not selling majority of their own products. They're buying other people's products and reselling them, marking it up 2.3, 2.8, whatever they are. Um, they're 1% profitable, 1% profitable. So if you add delivery into that, customers aren't coming to you anymore. You know, you're still paying exorbitant rent, but now you are literally gassing up vehicles, insuring vehicles, purchasing vehicles, adding payroll where those bud tenders are now, you know, mobile bud tenders coming to your door um, and you don't have any tax write-offs. So depending upon how your investors are supporting you, you know, what percentages that they're either you are raising money, let's say you owe 10% interest, right, on that money. That's going to be really hard for you to ever make a dime. Like really, really hard for you to ever make a dime. If you are purchasing your let's say you're vertical somewhere, right? Let's say you have a manufacturing license or you have a distro license and you're packaging your own flour so you can replace a skew and have a large, a larger piece of the puzzle owned by your company. Then you're getting closer to some strategy of economic success. Or I always just say like the most of the, the, the challenge is in the work. You know, there's not a super secret sauce when it comes to cannabis. Like you need to be able to get product cheaper than others. If you can buy in volume, that's really going to be able to help you. The brands are the only people making money. So therefore the brands have the ability to give you maybe an additional discount or additional cases or something to offset so you can make money as a retailer. Um, you definitely just have to be super creative. I, I really say like what you say, like if you are buying other people's products and selling them and marking them up at the general, you know, markup, you're net, that is not a recipe for success right now because we don't have the common tax write-offs as the normal businesses. Um, so the economics are really, really tough. Like you have to find somewhere to squeeze the brands or, you know, squeeze the consumer in a way where kind of compared to makeup, you know, nobody knows how much Kylie is making on a stupid lip kit but she's, she's probably making 500% markup, right? Like 600%, 1,000, there's no telling how much it costs to make some of these things. And so you have to get more involved with those rarer, harder to pinpoint items that people don't necessarily have. They're not comparing apples to apples with everyone, right? Maybe you have something that you can make an exorbitant markup on that other people wouldn't necessarily have access to. Um, but you definitely have to get creative with how you're running um, retail, especially in delivery. Um, me and my brother kind of compare Prop 64. Now, you know, cultivation is a lot more profitable for obvious reasons. And the key to cultivation is there's a lot more tax write-offs because a lot more pieces are involved with the cost of manufacturing the good. Everything is involved in the cost of growing the wheat. So a lot of the expenses that we have can be written off where 
even when you're on the retail side or the delivery side, you can't even write off your rent. You can't write off anything. Nothing is involved in the cost of manufacturing the good except whatever you paid for the good. So it's just definitely, you know, if you have investors that are willing to fund your business very cheaply, that's a rarity and it would be a miracle. And that would be a piece of the pie that's honestly necessary because it's that governmental exchange, like where you were getting tax breaks and where you were getting deductions. Now you need investors to offer something that can kind of offset some of these things for you to grow. Um, but yeah, the economics are very hard. Like we pivoted from the delivery, making money. Luckily at that point, the cultivation started making money. And now we've just been really trying to pinpoint how, if we want to have retail in the future, how we can make sure we're in an area that's going to be significantly profitable for us. Like that dry County example um, that we, we actually have a retail, um, in phase three, fingers crossed in Redwood city where we originally started our, our delivery business and that dry county, Redwood City will be the first to permit and there'll be six storefronts in the county. So we have a 33% chance right now um, in the final 18. So that's good. And it'll be, it'll be an interesting, interesting ride, but you have to be, you know, you have to really look forward to kind of like uh, in Kentucky, some of the busiest lotteries are the ones on the border, right? Because for a long time, Tennessee and other, those bordering um, businesses make so much more money than a lot of other places. Like, you really can't just think of it like, pop up the lemonade stand, John, you're going to make money. Like, no, you're not. Um, and then when we go into, I know you said cultivation, but starting around um, funding, it's very interesting. Like, <laughs> It's, it's one of those things you're either in the circle or you're not in the circle. You know, if it was easy for you to raise a million dollars already, by golly, it's going to be easy for you to probably raise a million dollars in cannabis. You know, it's riskier. People are going to want to see more. You're going to have to collateralize something. It's also the difference between like the have and the have nots. The haves can collateralize. The haves have land. The haves have things to collateralize. The have nots cannot collateralize cannot raise money on a start, you know, this is a startup. This, I mean, in a lot of times, it's very hard for any industry to raise money as a startup, right? Like you have no business, you are still in, you know, your business plan, your conceptual mode, maybe you have some pre-orders or something, but raising money as a startup is very difficult, even when you have a bank, even when you have normal investors or angel investors and people who are not out for blood. Um, cannabis, everyone's out for blood. Everyone wants your business. Everyone wants a path to 100% ownership. There's also, you know, it's a, when you're talking about you know, the respect or the lack of respect for proven success. I've never seen an industry in the world where proven success is looked at negatively except for cannabis. You know, you come from legacy. Wow. You come from something that obviously you were successful at. That's why you're here. You've made money in this business, you've taken a lot of risk, you've understood the market for a long time, you're ahead of a lot of the, you know, whether it's the strains or terpenes or just, you know, whatever the customer interaction that they're looking for, customer experience that they're looking for, you understand it, you've been there, you're, you literally have proven success, but they will look at someone that's coming from, you know, a cardboard expansion company and be like, this dude's got logistics, bro. He understands how to move these cardboard boxes coast to coast, you know? And you're like, man, this man's never smoked weed. Like you see a lot of executive suites, their whole C-suite does not smoke weed. They've never smoked weed, but they are literally so convinced they're going to come in and put distillate in a vape pen and turn the world on its head. Like <laughs> mind blowing, right? And then when you when you say like investors, background checks, right? Like these are two things. You're any investor that's investing in any business typically wants to see the criminal history of those they're investing in. And if your background check comes up and you have, you know, some felonies for cannabis, or you have misdemeanors for cannabis, I mean it just means you're doing what everybody else is doing, but you got caught. <laughs> and that is bad. They're not gonna look at that and think this is positive. Um I'm working with somebody right now, hopefully to raise some money on an indoor project that we have. And all of his investors are like, he, you know, we had talked about this before, like Marie, you and your brother have clean background checks. Yeah. And our background checks have been expunged. We, my brother has gone to like 
literally gone to jail for um, cannabis where he was, he had to do like two weeks. It wasn't anything super crazy because he got it all pled down. Um, but luckily it's off his record completely, right? If that showed up on his record, it would be bad. Like if my expungement showed up on my record, it would be bad. Like these, it would not be good. It's not looked at in any way of, uh, they literally, my investor would say, said recently, um, Marie, just making sure you and your brother have 10 years of clean background checks, right? Like, I'm only 34. Like, that's pretty much my entire adult life. Like, luckily, yeah, I'm, yes, yeah, yes, him and I both do have, we do. But man, to see like an industry where like they're taking something that was criminalized today in a lot of places and turning it into, you know, literally a, like a business from scratch, from start. But if you were caught doing that, then we're not going to give you a leg up into the introduction into compliantly doing that. But you were doing it illegal, like get the hell out of here, Bob. You got to keep on doing that over there. Like it's, it. there's no, it, I call it like the hacker dilemma, kind of to coin my, my own term where it's like hackers, good hackers, bad hackers, you know, there's all sorts of types of hackers, but they're very respected. Like, he, like a very respected industry. Apple or Google or any of these companies, they're actively always looking for hackers and good hackers, hopefully, that can break into their firewalls and prove to them where they have different, you know, stresses that need to be relieved in their system. And that for cannabis doesn't exist. It's like if you hack the system and you were super successful in the criminal market, we still don't think that you are a business person. We still don't think that you have business acumen like we still don't think that you are able to dance with you know the guys with the mbas in the room but the guys in the mba in the room don't know how to sell weed like they have no clue how to sell it they really don't and they will put your business nine times out of ten in the ground and i personally i'd love to see it i love to see it every time one of these mega i come from zip car and i'm fucking brilliant like great perfect 10 months later, the company spent $10 million. They've, they've got nothing to show for it. And they're slowly leaving California with their tail between their leg to run to Oklahoma. <laughs> they're like, please, oh, wow. please, yep. over and over. But yeah, I think there's definitely like, it, it's so many analogies that I use this for, but today we'll use it in this where you, know, you want funding for your cannabis company. Even me and my brother. We have a successful business. It is in physicality and in taxability, like on paper, documented. You can see a cash flow positive business. It's still not easy to raise money. It's still very difficult to raise money, especially for us because we want to retain ownership of our business and we want to go to you know get a line of credit or we want you know someone to fund us with sensible interest rates and things like that. Oh, hell no. Those just literally, it's, it's so few and far um, between. And then there's just back to the collateral. Like we don't own the land that our farm is on. Like we only own the license in our company that's there. So, you know, having a lease and a license is not very much to collateralize. It's, it's not something that's very, um, most investors aren't super excited unless they have something tangible that they don't have to go and operate. <laughs> like, sure, we'll give you the business if we fail. That is not sexy to the average investor. You know, like go over to New York and tell them, you guys can run a farm if we fail. They're going to run for high heavens, right? Um, but it's, it's crazy the irony of it all because you're a startup in a risky business that's looking for money. Like what? Like if you were a startup in a non-risky business, that probably doesn't happen unless you've, you've got it. And then our type of people, like the people that are for the culture, like we're definitely normally not financial advisors. Like we appreciate financial advisors. We need them. We need every piece of finance, um, technology, even funding all the way through. But the, like the people in one sect weren't hanging out and smoking joints with the people from the other sect. And the people from the other sect don't really respect um, 
our type of people and we don't really respect their type of people so you know like we're more like the earth the air the water breathing healthy they're more like where can we frack more oil and tax more people and you know how can we rule the world in a more monetary commoditized fashion so they're not all bad we we, we need them obviously to run these businesses but um, you can't be further away from the two types of people that would get along in in a high school you know what i mean like in a room in a room where these people would naturally just like magnetically repel one another but it's a necessary evil wow i think that was just i, I could end the show here because you just gave me so much gold that i'm just like well what what's the point of me even saying another word but I will. <laughs> I'm only I'm only like stating like my kindergarten truths right now. Like, <laughs> I, you're giving I, me a crayon, but you're not giving me any paper to draw with. Yeah, what is man, wrong here? <laughs> that's so funny. It's 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 amazing. Everything you've said, I, I love how you phrased it that this is the one industry where you get penalized for for prior success, where instead right. of being like, oh, this person has a track record of succeeding in this industry, my investment is de-risked. It's the opposite where it's like, oh no, this person was has been working in cannabis. I don't know if I can trust. Them. And it's funny, you know, I also feel personally, I feel somewhat validated because I feel like part of my secret sauce is that I, I'm able to go and hang out and smoke with the finance bros, the chads, as they're known. <laughs> I even have the chad haircut now. I could right. I could do the, the full man bun. It's totally, totally unironic, I swear. Super <laughs> and uh, it, it, so I could go undercover with the chads. Uh. <laughs> and also with, with the people who, who, you know, the underground people who have been the legacy operators who are more ideologically aligned with what I think is the true cannabis culture. And you mentioned the scenario of like these companies that have an executive team full of people that don't consume or, or haven't consumed. And to me, I, I always am a big critic of that because it's, it's just like a common sense thing, right? Where I, I tell people, would you want to get into the coffee business with someone who doesn't drink coffee or doesn't know anything about coffee? It, it's the same thing. And by the way, cannabis is a, a lot more complicated than coffee. I constantly remind people, look, this is the cannabis business emphasis on cannabis. It's kind of the core thing here. And if you're not well-versed in that, if you're not willing to study cannabis, which by the way, is incredibly complicated and there's new stuff coming out every day. If you're not willing to immerse yourself in it, then don't even get involved. And I, I will admit that back in the day when I was just starting out, I was pretty ignorant. I was coming from, I mentioned I was in the Bay area. I was a Googler back in the day and I worked in Redwood city once upon a time too. So it, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you're still, still targeting that tech community with the disposable income. I think that's very solid, but you know, my whole thing was like, you know, I was 24 at the time. And I said, well, why would I try to compete in Silicon Valley and do a startup there against all these Harvard MBAs and blah, blah, blah. When I could go into the cannabis industry and I'm going to be competing against people that haven't had the same opportunities, don't have the same pedigree, haven't had you know, that, that, that resume that, that I can use as a differentiator and, oh, it's going to be much easier to compete in this industry. I learned very, very quickly. <laughs> this industry is much harder. Tech and Silicon Valley and all that stuff is like a walk in the park compared to doing anything in cannabis. And so I, I quickly realized, and I also had that kind of bias of like, Oh, like these underground people, they, what do they know about business? And then I spent some time with these people and I realized, oh, these people know way more about business than, <laughs> than any of these corporate douchebags, pardon my French, because, and, and I also realized like these people have way more integrity, at least the successful ones, because the stakes are so much higher. You talk about risk management, but when the, the risk 
of being a cannabis operator, especially a legacy operator in, in an illicit market, the risks are so much higher and the cost of an error are so much higher. And, and you know, this is quite frankly why I never participated in that industry or in that part of the industry. Cause I was like, I don't trust myself to, to not mess something up. It, Cause if, if I mess something up, you know, I had a mentor who was like a super OG and he always would make fun of me about, he was like, oh, you're a goody two shoes. And he would always say, Michael, don't worry, you'll look great in orange. And I was like, no, man, I know what I am and what I'm not. And, and what I'm not is, is super duper organized. And to be in quote unquote, organized crime, you have to be organized. And I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm going to stick to the legal stuff where I could, if I mess something up, I could always come back from it. You know? <laughs> so right. Right. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's just me, me showing the folks who, who might have those same misconceptions that I had before I knew better that you're totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> if you're uh, investing in cannabis and you haven't, you know, heard of the Integrity Farms episode from South Park, if like if you're the, it's the irony truly like if you are putting your money into an industry, but you are so far away from what's actually going on in that industry, like you literally like the South Park bros have a, a more understanding, a better understanding of what is really going on in this crazy cannabis industry than most high level investors or high level financial, you know, analysts that are looking at like valuations, like companies, you know, that is literally sitting here valuating these cannabis companies, but have no clue of what's really going on. And to your point, even more like the integrity piece, like, man, I'd much rather sit across and do business with someone that I did business with in the legacy market and that came back with my money every time, year after year after year, then sitting there with like some Chad that I know this contract isn't even worth the ink that it's written on. Like, I'm going to have to take this man to court. Like, I'm going to have to litigate for 10 years to ever find a dime out of this deal. And even with cannabis, because it's so overly taxed right now, everyone knows like, if, if there's money here, you have to take it out by the time it gets here. Even whether you're doing it the right way or not, right? Everyone is just literally sitting here like, how can we suck all the profit out of this business so by the time it gets down here, there's nothing for the government or nothing for the investors or not. Like, it's literally like the people, the scum of the earth that you would not want to do anything with. But any nascent industry, I mean, this is the beginning of any industry. Like, I said it recently in a thing, but it was, you know, the merchants made more than the miners when the gold rush came. Like the people in ancillary businesses will still probably make money and are making way more money than those of us holding licenses inside, deeply entrenched in all this taxation. So there's definitely like an angle to play, but I much, 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 much rather go back to those people that you know, if you did me right in the legacy market, like I know you're, I know you're a good person. And I know the people that weren't good people versus now the evolution is like, oh, I'm going to take you to court and we're going to litigate or we can arbitrate or we can mediate this or we can like blah, 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 blah. Like all of the things that we as really, really honest, like integrity driven prior operators really valued and then we got into bed with all these people that were supposed to be like the pedigree bro the pedigree over here is supposed to be phenomenal i'm supposed to be able to you know trust these people with my firstborn my trust my life my real estate and they are literally going to rob you to high hills the first opportunity they get and so we're just like it was another like quick learn for me and my brother that uh, these these contracts are not worth anything and do not give your equ equity away to these groups because it's literally going to uh, probably be the opposite of whatever they promised you yep. every time. Yep. And it's, I, I, I learned that pretty quickly myself after, before I even did anything in the industry, which, you know, I, I, I'm a big advocate of this and I put this in my book, the cannabis business book, which is available on Amazon. And two of the things that I, I preach in there, one is, first of all, this industry is unlike any other industry. So if you think just because 
you're a business whiz or you have that cardboard <laughs> logistics company or you sold widgets or whatever that you could just move into cannabis and and prop up some kind of business model and get going, you are doomed to fail. You're going to have a very rude awakening. And, and the second thing I, I tell people all the time is do your homework, do your research. Before I tried to make any money in cannabis, before I put a penny into cannabis, I spent literally years getting to know the people and the industry and the plant to feel like I had any ability to, to do anything competent. And so start as an advocate and start as a volunteer or, and, or get a mentor or, or do something to actually get involved without kind of going all in necessarily, unless you're ready and you're, you're, you know, you have some, some knowledge and direction and a team and some resources. But what I learned in that exploratory kind of time period, when I was meeting with all these different folks from from the OGs to the suits, that some of these people in the boardroom with the pedigree, they're the real criminals. Because <laughs> some of the way, as far as the way that they would do business and feel totally okay in screwing the other side of whatever deal they were doing and feeling like <laughs> the game is the game, if you will. Right. And it was incredible because of course, again, and, and I put this in the book, but the legacy operators, all you had was, was trust and a reputation and you've ruined that once and <laughs> your livelihood right. is potentially, Word you know, exactly, exactly. And so I, I encourage anyone getting into this industry or in the industry today to, to keep that same culture of integrity, of honesty, and ultimately doing the right thing for the plant, for the patients, and just in general, because to me, that is the cannabis culture. That is why I, I'm going to presume that is why people like Marie suffer through all the pain and effort and hard work of being in this industry is to champion that way of being and that way of doing so that this industry is not like every other industry. So we can do something that's ultimately better and not exploitative, not shitting on the environment, not taking advantage of people, not commoditizing access to, to health and wellness. But I, I don't want to be presumptive. So I, I want to ask you, Marie, why do you do all this stuff? It's really hard. It's hard to make money. It's super competitive. It doesn't sound like money grows on trees kind of thing that I always hear cannabis is. So why do you do all this stuff? I'm curious. All right. I, I wonder the same thing sometimes. I, but <laughs> overall, I mean, I definitely get to do what I love and I'm really just blessed to do what I love in a non-criminalized place. Um, I think that since I'm not from California, I have a, a higher value on just being able to like be realistic that I'm selling a federally illegal item. I'm delivering it to your door on a daily basis. And, you know, of course it's going to be hard. Of course, you know, we're, we're on the cusp of prohibition. We're on the cusp of changing all of these laws and the stigmas and the things that are presented in such an ill way that we've seen and even like the love we have for alcohol, but the hate we have for cannabis, which is ironic in itself. So, I mean, for me, I just like, I always come back to just feeling really blessed that I come from Nashville, Tennessee, you know, I'm in San Francisco, California, doing what I love, even if it's overly taxed, even if it's a headache, even if literally I have to pivot 20 times to, to pay bills. It's, it's all in all, uh, it's like a little bit of a game, but a game that I really enjoy playing. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to have to work for someone else. I wouldn't want to have to, you know, enter into a different industry. That would be insane to me. So it's still at the end of the day, you know, this is still criminal where I'm from. It's still criminalized where I'm from, where I was born, where I was raised my whole life. So for me, it's a little different. I kind of look at people in California where I'm like, you're just now trying to get into this, bro. Like, it's been legal since the 96 here. Like if you were scared from 96, if you were waiting for the state to make prop 64 to get into it, like you're already behind, like you're, you're just crazy. Like that's, you are not the people that we want to reward for being involved in this industry. There's definitely like a sense for me of just like, I'm crazier than most. Cause 
I come from a different place, right? Like I don't come from here. And I, I just feel fortunate to be in the industry in a, in a sense of ownership and a sense of like me and my brother engaging in all of these licenses that we do hold. And I'm proud, like him and I, both being black, like we don't have investors in our farm. Um, we own 100% of our farm. We've paid everybody back. We don't own the land though, that's the key. Um, and now we're on to another, uh, another opportunity that's four times the size, right? So just being able to like continue to go in and, and play with the big boys and play with the suits and be able to sit at the table and speak the lingo, like those are those are definitely wins for me and being able to, um, you know, talk, even just have this conversation and be someone that people can look to for, you know, mentorship or something, but just like to see, you know, if you, if you see it, that it can be done and it takes seeing the believing sometimes to see a group that's, you know, young and a minority group that's black owned that can come in and just hold the ground through and through, even though it was very, 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 very challenging. It just definitely is rewarding to come out, even though we're, we're, we're still at the beginning, right? Nothing's even happened yet, <laughs> but, but at least to, to continually evolve, right? To continually evolve, to continually pivot, to be successful and to definitely do, do good business, right? Like I've, I think it's very beautiful to, uh, come into an industry and try to like hold that integrity that we've all known. And, you know, we're literally meeting with the groups of people that like really like to screw each other and then go play golf afterward and be like, ha ha, you got me this time. I'm going to get you on the next one. All you pull. I didn't read that part of the contract. Ha ha ha. Like, I'm like <laughs> I've never in my life seen groups of people feel this good when they're screwing each other and just roll it to the next one. Right. And then I'm like, wow, I can easily see how the world has essentially become a piece of nothing because these are the deals that are being played, you know, like, whoa. Um, so yeah, I think that, that this, for me, I'm just really grateful and thankful. And like, I'm in a best, a very blessed place where the farm enables me to kind of advocate for all of these things that I feel so passionately about and not have to get paid from all of these people or from consulting and doing pro bono work or mentorship or advocacy. I really get to come from a place of like genuine heartfelt like passion, like this is right, this is wrong. So like, I, I think for me, there's you know so many pieces of that crazy question, like why to exist in this crazy industry. But like my brother and I definitely got ahead, like just by the hair of our chin, like get into the evolution that we could sustain, like an evolution into compliant cannabis that we could sustain and that we've been able to sustain it pretty well thus far and continue to grow. And we want to eventually, you know, secure some, some retail and get some brick and mortar and be more vertical and introduce more brands through that vertical and do some statewide distro and prep for, you know, when we can export into places like New York and, all over the United States. So it's definitely like a hinge of, uh, you know, it's like <laughs> my mom used to say, my mom was always in business. She was like, you know, things are never as good as they seem. Things are never as bad as they seem. Like, you know, you're going to have really high, 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 highs. You're going to have really low, 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 low. So it's just really being able to like keep your head up and uh, keep going because it's definitely the hardest thing. I always say to people like, would you run a business? Yes. Okay. Would you run a business if you knew it was going to take you six, seven years to make money? Hmm. Okay. Would you then add all the complexities of a brand new industry, regulatory frameworks, compliance, da, 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 not like you have to say yes to all those. How much do you love weed? Like how much would you do this if all you could do is smoke for free? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh. That's funny. That's right. Show, right? <laughs> that's it. Yeah, right. That's the the first few years I was doing my cannabis education networking events here in New York. That was like, yeah, I made some money, but for me, I was like, oh man, I get all this free weed all the time. This is the best. Be between that and meeting all the really interesting people I was meeting all the time, I was like, well, who's got it better than me? This is it. That gets old eventually, but right. you know. Right. If I told that to my brother, I'm like, I smoke for free today. He's like. <laughs> you <are the> work. <laughs> said get back to work <laughs> get back to work okay, okay i do want to ask you before i let you go what advice do you have for people who are who are just 
awakening to the cannabis industry and who, who want to get involved, whether it's through entrepreneurship, through investment, or maybe even to those legacy operators who, who want to cross over? What advice do you have for, for those folks? I would say definitely going back to getting the education necessary that's going to be, you know, setting yourself up for success. Like I remember when I wanted to start a delivery service, I was doing uh, interviews, trying to work at on-demand food places. Like I'm in San Francisco, right? Like I want to see on-demand food businesses be delivered. I want to see that. I want to read the regs, you know, my cannabis regulations, but at the same time, I want to be able to see other businesses that I can put in you know, using those same skill sets that they have into this business. Um, but it's definitely like a research, doing your research. Like you said, most of, most of what you're going to pay somebody to tell you, you could have read for free. I mean, and even from like my standpoint, I pay a lot of attorneys. I pay a lot of realtors. I pay a lot of different people to tell me all these different things, but I could have read a lot of them in the regs, like, and, and, you, generally speaking, you still should because they're not always right. These people are definitely wrong a lot of the time. Um, but just just doing your research, even if it's just to invest, you know, like what pieces of the industry have been really stagnant? Which pieces of the industry are growing? What's the normal growth rate? Like, would I want to invest more in cultivation? Or like a lot of people are investing into these huge um retail msos right like do you want to where where do you want to invest what makes the most sense for you um or even as an entrepreneur it goes back to like patience and passion <laughs> you're gonna need a lot of patience and you're gonna need a lot of passion because you might be a little poverty stricken throughout that course of time right um but tons of patience a lot of determination um just like i guess cannabis is kind of like in a way one of those weird motivational speeches it's like you gotta be willing to sacrifice now so you can live later and nobody else can live, right? Like that's that's the cannabis industry in itself. You're just gonna like keep your head down and push, push, push and educate yourself and like dream really, really big because even for me, I literally started the, the first delivery just to replace my normal job. Like I was like, I just need to make six figures and like do something I love, right? Like just that's not crazy. And then we started, you know, really rapidly expanding this thing and now we have this huge company and then like the bigger the bigger you are you know the the harder you fall right so dream really really big but just be very very careful and make sure you can educate yourself because the biggest risk mitigation that any of me and my brother can ever do is educating ourselves you know getting around people that are in a place of success i really believe like you know show me your friends i'll show you your future as much mm -hmm. as i'd don't like the suits. Do I need the suits? Heck yeah. Do I have to hang out with the suits? Heck yeah. Like, do I have to, you know, fake it till you make it sometimes? Absolutely. Like, there's just a point of, uh, you know, no one's done this before. I kind of laugh. I always say like, we're writing the book. Like every day I go to work, I write the book. When we were developing our delivery in 2018, every day we were writing the book of how to expand and grow this delivery service. Right. So it was definitely like one of those scenarios like nothing it's far different than a lot of industries because the answers just aren't there you know you don't get to just go read a book and it tell you how to do coffee distribution and how you can go get Kona coffee from Hawaii and then you can go over here and do that like it's the art industry is so not similar to any industry like to your point Michael like this the even the strains and the terpenes and just being able to like consist like consistently get the same effect from different things is something that cannabis is still working on. We don't even have national brands, right? Like we are still certainly struggling. And even the biggest national brands don't actually own any of their production. Mm -hmm. So you're like, what the white labeling machine? That's all we are in cannabis is like, boom, put slap in different names on different, different labels. But I would definitely say it goes back to this. If you want to get in the industry, you totally can. Like, I think too many people are like, um, give people a very negative outlook on coming in in the industry and like, oh, you can't because it's so hard. And you just need to find a, a landlord that's going to allow you to apply and hopefully do so for free while you sit your, your butt there on that property and have, you know, no rent or very, very discounted rent for as long as it's going to take you to get through your permitting process. And then have some of the same agility that you have in any other businesses to be able to pivot and create revenue streams and create new revenue streams. And what happens if that one goes away? Oh, there's gotta be a new one over here and like network with people that are in the industry making. There's 
millions and billions of dollars floating around this industry, right? Just got to go figure out how to put your name on some. Um, so it's not, it's not super difficult. I know people that have no licenses making hand over fist brokering or, you know, just from being able to connect dots. Uh, but yeah, I definitely think for me, it's like, because I was always one of those people like that was willing to make less money to have longevity. Like when I was bringing my brother in, I'm like, yo, bro, like you can make all the money in the world, but you can't buy a house easily. You can't, you can't move the money around. You can't even bank. Like you, all the things that sound so cool when you're in the gray market, like when it actually comes to purchasing things, it's fair. You have no purchasing power. You're no one, you know, like versus coming into the legal market, building your credit in a legal industry, like literally your personal credit and your business credit um, and coming out with a way for you to fund more businesses and collateralize more businesses and have like, I've always been one of those people, like I'm willing to make less money to have longevity. Like, and if, if you are, if, if you are willing to do that, like coming from the illicit market, the gray market into our industry, like the government is in our industry. And Uncle Sam's not playing. Like, Uncle Sam does not care. He is not like, you either get to stay over there and you get to hide from Uncle Sam or you get to come over here and you get to pay Uncle Sam. You might not make any money, but you're going to pay Uncle Sam. So it's one of those like, <laughs> like sleeping well at night, but having way less in your bank account or, you know, not sleeping so well at night, but figuring out where you're going to bury cash. I don't know right. um, or how you're going to figure out how to get it into a bank account. So I think, it's just one of those scenarios that for me, like it was worth it. I don't think a lot of people would consider it worth it to transition right now. And I think the government definitely is to blame for that. You know, we should not, we are in a cash grab. Like cannabis was not, there was no compassion. There was literally no medical like thought process behind it. There's no access. Like even in California, we're so fake progressive, like <laughs> access. Ha, huh. you know, even in California, majority of the cities banned compliant cannabis when we went Prop 64. So, I mean, we really have to look at, you know, how can we get more uh, common sense regulation? And that process would alleviate some of this because the transition is so hard going from the illicit market. And we as like, as legal operators, we would love more people to come into the legal market because that's only going to allow less illicit operators to operate and then we we know that we'll never get it like all the way to zero right like that's just incomprehensible but the the fact too is that the government is making it so hard to exist in the compliant network um it's really like there's no advantage, you know, like there's no true advantage. Like if I meet the average person on the street, like, yo, well, oh, there's, it should be a lot of programs or a lot of, you know, I have this wraparound service for you. You could take your book of business and do this with it. And then me, you know, we are going to slowly coach you through this process where reality is there, there's nothing like that right now, but the government is not incentivizing anyone to come into the compliant space. That's right. They, they don't want you to succeed in the compliance space, which that, that's a whole other can of worms. But I, I want to I wanna just thank you for, for that amazing answer. I love it so much, partially because so much of it is stuff that I preach in the book. We independently came to the same conclusions, which number one, the, the number one most common mistake that I believe people make getting into this industry is not doing enough research and not getting educated enough. So please do yourself a favor, go on Amazon, pick up the cannabis business book where, you know, I, I literally wrote this book because there was no such thing. And so I interviewed 50 operators, policymakers, doctors, et cetera, across the cannabis ecosystem to ask them, how do you succeed in this business? And a lot of them will tell you exactly what Marie just shared with us. And my, my personal two cents on it is if you don't have the passion and patience to, to be in this for several years before making money or going through all these incredible obstacles and, and hurdles, which are really unique to cannabis and you don't have to deal with in pretty much every other industry, if you don't have the willingness to go through all of the above, 
you're probably not going to succeed because you're going to compete with a crazy person like me or like Marie, who's willing to do all of the above. And we're just going to outwork you and outlast you because for me, and, and I'm guessing for Marie, this is a lifelong endeavor. We, we realize that even, even you being a decade plus into this, this is still the early days. And this thing is going to evolve and change so dramatically. And 10 years from now, the industry will look completely different from what it is today. And we're going to have to adapt and evolve along the way, no matter what. Luckily, there's a plant that's really good for, at least for me, for making me patient and agreeable and amenable to change. And, <laughs> and so I, I owe all, all praise to the most high, the cannabis plant itself. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do a coaching session because we're over time. And also because I feel like you've given our audience so much game today that folks are probably going to need to rewind and listen to this a couple of times to really take in all of the gems. And I just want to thank you, Marie. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you and hearing your insights, your experience. And I want to give you the opportunity to say any, any parting words and also tell the folks where they can get a hold of you, where they can get more info about you and your businesses, how they can support the work you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And closing again, super, super happy to be here. Thank you, Michael. Um, I just think that we're coming up on like the more and more exciting points of uh, the cannabis future, right? We've got federal legalization. We've got the Schumer bill, the Booker bill um, that's going through, which I think has some positives and some negatives like anything. But um, just making sure that everyone is paying as much attention to their local politics as as possible, because that's where all the rules really are are played and made, and that's where the the small businesses of all sorts, you know, will be will be winning or losing based upon whatever local legalization is done. And there's more taxes to come, right? We're we're not even here. We don't even have federal taxes yet. Ha 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 or third party distribution out of, you know, whatever state that you're in. So I think the good times are, are coming, you know, hopefully <laughs> we can, we can have some uh, policy that's being made that makes sense, some common sense policy, which is a struggle for us in America, I know. Um, but hopefully there's more and more people like, you know, Michael and I that are involved in this industry definitely gives me as much hope as I possibly can have that good things are yet to come. And then you can find us at MD Numbers Inc. on Instagram and mdfarms.ca on Instagram. And our website is mdnumbersinc.com. Awesome. And I'll make sure to link all of those in the show notes. And, and my, my last word will be if what you heard today from Marie resonated with you, then get involved in this industry because we need people like you that are going to be dedicated and put in their passion and energy into doing things the right way because there's still a long ways to go and we are still just getting started in a lot of ways so if you're one of those people that would be happy doing this work for free or for free weed <laughs> then please get involved there's plenty of opportunity it won't be easy but it will be worth it Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is the cannabis business coach. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is. Hi, Mike Z is the cannabis business coach.